You're watching Twin Tier Sunday with Jennifer Sheehan. Did you ever dream of becoming a rock star? Did you ever say a small town guy like me can never make it big? Well, today you're going to meet a man who has worked hard on a daily basis to become one of the best drummers in the industry. He's infused his work with passion and is part of a show so innovative that it swept the country by storm. And guess what? He's a small town guy from Horseheads. Today, Jeff Clay tells us how he fought to keep his dream living and how hard work and a little bit of luck can get you to your dream. All right, so you just saw a little bit of what Mr. Jeff here takes part of every few months. He goes on tour. He's probably one of the best drummers in the world. And yes, he's from right here in Horseheads. So you better start listening. That's right, Jeff. How did you get involved with music from the start? When did it catch your attention? Uh, when I was a child. I mean, I grew up in a, in a house where my mother and father listened to music constantly. We, uh, they were huge country music fans. So obviously on the weekends we had to watch Hee Haw every Saturday night. But during the day there was also American Bandstand and Soul Train and stuff like that. And it was just around me all the time. Um, here again, I grew up in a time where we didn't have only but a, a few television channels. So when there wasn't something good on television, it was turn on the radio or, or put an album on and listen to it. So this was kind of around me ever since I was born. And then at what point did you start saying, you know what, I'm going to make it my life? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, when I was, when I was very young, you know, my mother pushed us, my sister and I, to, to pick up an instrument. And after uh, getting frustrated with trying to play guitar and then trying to play piano, uh, the drum seemed the, uh, the logical choice. I was pretty athletic and coordinated and it was, it came to me fairly easily. So that's kind of where it all started. But I was, uh, when I was young, I was a baseball player played in Little League and you know of course I had dreams of being in the majors and all this and that and, and uh, one day my hip fell apart when I was 13 years old so that kind of changed my course of uh, my dream because I was eliminated from sports activity for like three or four years while my while my hip healed and the following year I was uh, home on summer vacation and uh, I saw a commercial for the midnight special in this band, Kiss. Tonight, special welcome for Kiss. And I was, I was so intrigued by this, I, I talked my parents into letting me stay up and watch the show, and I saw Kiss, and it completely changed my life. Oh my when, I, when I saw them on the Midnight Special, it was, I was sitting probably, you know, four inches from the screen, staring at this with my little, uh, GE cassette recorder up to the speaker and I recorded this and I played this tape over and over and over again and just seeing that show they only played two songs but it was enough to completely you know it put me in orbit I would that that is what I was going to do so from that point on drumming became a little bit more serious and and when I actually became physically able to pursue sports again you know I was kind of you know I was pretty pretty deep into drumming. I was taking lessons in school, I was taking private lessons here locally, and, and I had gotten a drum set, and it really just, it went from there. And I had such support from my parents, and that, that was another uh, crucial element to this whole thing. It was, you know, they, they gave me my time and my space. They let me go upstairs and make all the noise I wanted to. <laughs> All I had to do was, you know, stay out of trouble in school and pass my grades and, you know, be a good kid. So it all, it all kind of worked out. That's wonderful. So at this point then, you started playing on a regular basis. How, how between that and getting to the TSO, what was the change at that point in changing your career? Well, when I was 18 and I, and I got out of high school, I, I was playing locally in bars at that time. So I, I had met some older guys who were 
older musicians who, you know, through word of mouth, hey, you got to check out this plate kid. He can actually play the drums. So I got hooked up with some older people who were playing in, in bands locally. And, you know, we play out every weekend. We make some money. And I kind of figured out that, that I was pretty good. You know, I wasn't, uh, I had no idea that I was the greatest, but I was pretty good. And if I was going to do something, I couldn't do it in horse heads. And I knew this. So my first move was to Florida, which was a failure. I came back home and then I had some friends who lived out in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. And I moved out there, joined a cover band, met some other people, then I moved close, closer to Boston. And when I was out in Boston, I realized I was a small fish in a big pond. You know, there were some, there were some cats out there who could play circles around me with one hand and one foot. And I realized then I need to get really good and really work at this or think about doing something else. So I found a drum teacher, this, this guy, Dave Desenzo, who was phenomenal. He, uh, he took me under his wing and, you know, straightened some things out that I was doing wrong. Going further ahead here, uh, I just met some great people, some other musicians out in the Boston area. I was in a band called Wicked Witch, which was a, a hard rock metal band. And the singer of this band went on to join a band called Sabotage, an 80s metal progressive band that was, uh, you know, they had, they had a deal on Atlantic Records. They were uh, traveling the world. They had a really good thing going on. Zach Stevens left my band in Boston and joined this band Sabotage. So at this point, I was, uh, I was 30 years old and thinking to myself, okay, my singer's gone. My band is breaking up and what am I doing? So I figured, you know, time to move back home. So I, I came back to Horseheads in, uh, in 1993. And just on a whim, I, I called Zach one day to see if, uh, you know, what he was doing, how he was doing with the band and their drummer had left. And he said, dude, we need you down in Florida. They want you to join the band. And I couldn't believe it. I, I, I had no, I didn't audition. I didn't, my audition was demo tapes that I had done with, with, with Wicked Witch and uh, some photos and there was a little bit of video but anyhow on Zach's word he uh, stood up for me and got me down to join this band. Uh, the band at the time, Sabotage, uh, they had recently just lost their guitar player and one of the founding members and it was a really strange time because the band was in flux, it was you know almost on the brink of, of falling apart. So when I went down there I was like you know, I was totally prepared. I kept my mouth shut. I played the drums and I tried not to give anybody any grief or any reason to doubt me. Lord, bring on the night. And we, uh, we went on a tour. We toured the States in 1994. We went to Japan that same year and I, I did a live record in Japan with the band. So through all my years of struggling and, and playing and working, my whole, I figured if I could do a tour and do a record, I won. Yeah. You know, there are so many people who, who never get the chance to even do this. And just by a stroke of luck and, you know, a lot of hard work and a good impression that I left with my friend Zach, within a couple months, I, I did both and I couldn't believe it. So anyhow, this was in 1994, and here we are 21 years later, and I'm still working with the same group of people. The first studio record I did with Sabotage was a record called Dead Winter Dead. And this was in 1995. This was a concept record. My, my producer, my manager... My boss, my friend, Mr. Paul O'Neill, he, uh, he writes all the lyrics and all the concepts for Sabotage and Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Oh but first, Sabotage did this record about the war that was going on in Sarajevo. That's what this record was about. And part of the, part of the story was a cello player who used to sit in the square in Sarajevo and play his cello while the war was going on around him. So. The song Christmas Eve Sarajevo 1224 is, is an instrumental, it's Carol of the Bells with our own twist on it. 
but that's what this song is about. In the uh, in winter of 1995, we released the record. Uh, a DJ in Florida, Mason Dixon, got a hold of this song and started playing it locally down in the Tampa area. This is where we were, the band was based out of. And all of a sudden, there was just this huge response to this song. And here we are, Sabotage, the heavy metal band, and here we have Christmas Eve Sarajevo, a Christmas song going in a completely different direction. So through a lot of phone calls and some legwork and some, uh, some quick thinking, uh, Paul O'Neill and the management company decided, you know, we need to take advantage of this song. Um, Paul O'Neill had the concept of this, of Trans-Siberian Orchestra in his head for years. And this was the vehicle to launch this concept. So we put the name Trans-Siberian Orchestra on this project. We went to the studio the following year. We did it, we did uh, Christmas Eve and other stories. And right now we've sold close to 5 million of those records. And here I am, like I said, 20 years later, the same group of people that were in Sabotage. I can't believe it transformed into the Trans-Siberian Orchestra and who to thunk? I mean that's like the the that's the, the phrase everything happens for a reason is that's the story right there that's absolutely incredible yep. so now you go on tour with this big band this is an absolutely incredible sight if you've never seen it I know they're the closest place you said it may be Wilkes-Barre to go and see you yep. guys and sometimes in maybe Buffalo or Rochester um but how is it like to tour, and what is the tour like? You need to explain to them how big this production is. Well, let's, you know, first of all, when we first started touring, and I've toured with a lot of different bands. I've toured with Sabotage. We've been all over the world. I also play in a band called Metal Church. Uh, when trans Green Orchestra first started touring, it was bare bones. I mean, it was, you know, a couple buses with, you know, 12 people on a bus, uh, a couple trucks with some PA and some lighting and a fog machine and, you know, a couple things like that. We were just doing theaters and in the very first tour that we did in 1999, this was like, we were kind of pressured, or we were convinced to do the tour by a DJ in Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Bill Lewis. He loved the record, played it continually on Christmas Eve in the Cleveland area. And my wife, Kathy, can attest to that because that's where she's from. Um, so the idea was, let's, let's do some shows. Let's see what happens. So we booked seven shows, 1999. Um, the response was great. And, and honestly, it was one of the most exciting, nerve-wracking moments of my life when I, I walked on the stage, this metal guy <laughs> and my metal bandmates wearing a tuxedo, ready to go out and play Christmas music. And we're all looking at each other, shaking in our boots, going, what are we doing? And we played our first show in Philadelphia, and it was a, it just went over so well. Anyhow, the following year, word of this show got out. We were presented with the problem of having 70 shows to do between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So what we did was we took the, the original lineup of the band, myself, Johnny Middleton, Chris Caffrey, Al Petrelli, uh, Bob Kinkle, who was one of the songwriters, we split that core in two, and we formed two different touring groups. So starting in 2000, we had an East Coast Trans-Siberian Orchestra and a West Coast Trans-Siberian Orchestra. We, we needed to do this just to cover the dates that we had available. Coming up after the break, we learn how the TSO transformed into an arena-based show and what motivates Jeff to keep pushing the limits. If you've ever seen Trans-Siberian Orchestra, there is literally 20 people on stage. You gotta, you gotta accommodate these people, you gotta feed these people. Um, so the expense of doing this was, was astronomical. The first three or four years was mainly just theaters. And we, for some reason, the city of Cleveland, they, they loved this, this project and we used to play got almost like a week straight in downtown Cleveland and almost sell out every night. But this this just became word of mouth. And we had the song on the radio 
uh, Sarajevo 1224, which was always doing well. And we put out another CD called The Christmas Attic. We had some pretty good action with that. But the tour itself was just, uh, you know, it was, it was in, enduring in the fact that it was a lot of work. We started doing two shows a day on the weekends. Uh, you know, here again, the management company is trying to figure out how do we break this thing? How do we break this? So I think it was 2005, uh, The Lost Christmas Eve was our third holiday CD that we released. And there's a song in there called Wizards in Winter. Mm -hmm. And there was a, and you'll see these all over the country. There's these lighting groups that, you know, light their houses up and they, they sync it up to music. And this one gentleman had done this in the Cincinnati area and he came to our show and, you know, wow, this is pretty cool. And, you know, and, and next thing you know, his house and this song are on YouTube and it becomes this sensation. Miller Light approaches us about using the song in one of their advertisement campaigns. Miller Lite was sponsoring the NFL on ESPN. So all of a sudden we had this commercial with our song playing, you know, ESPN. It was on ESPN every half hour at least. That's wild. All of a sudden this whole thing started really rolling. And we, the, the size of the show had gotten bigger. Here again, Paul O'Neill, I can't give this guy enough credit because he's insane. He is a completely, you know, driven, highly intelligent, motivated person, but he just would not stop as far as upping the ante on the show, making the show bigger, making the show brighter, making it hotter, making it, you know, you name it. So eventually we became too big to fit in theaters and we moved this thing into arenas. And for, for whatever reason, it was uh, the perfect storm. Everything kind of clicked and all of a sudden this thing just took off. It is also a great story, and it's a great, it's a great show. It's got a message to it, along with the, you know, playing in front of 10,000 people a show and this kind of thing, and you know, all the adulation that comes with that. It's something good, and people just, this becomes people's holiday every year. You know, this is what a lot of people do. They'll, they'll bring their family. This is, this is their family outing for the years to come see TSO, and, and we've become this, you know, it's an annual thing, and that's the beauty of it. Christmas is coming around every year for, for a long time to come, I think. So well, I let's think, hope so. <laughs> I, I think my gig is, is pretty secure, but um, but no, I could not be happier with, with where this thing has, has gone, knowing where it came from. You know, it's, it's a pretty, and trust me, every night I sit on the stage, my guitarist, Del Portrelli, tells me, he goes, count the exit signs. Whenever you're having doubts about this or whenever you're having a bad day, count the exit signs. And when you got about 50 exit signs in a building you're playing, you know you're playing in a big building. <laughs> so it's pretty reassuring to look out there and you know, I sit there while our, our narrator is, is narrating and uh, you know, I'll look around these rooms sometime and go, God, I can't even believe, I can't believe what's happened. But here again, you know, it's a lot of hard work. Call it luck, but we've made our own luck. And we've, uh, we've been able to to go out every year and put on a spectacular show. We have amazing musicians on the stage on each band. Uh, the lighting, the production is, is second to none. So initially it was mainly New York City, you know, and that's how we filled out the roster for these bands. And once the thing became bigger, you obviously get the attention of some more people nationally and worldwide. And you know, right now we've got uh, my violinist, Roddy Chong, used to work with Shania Twain and Celine Dion. Uh, my guitarist, Joel Holkstra, is uh, he was with Night Ranger for a number of years. He's played on Broadway in uh, Rock of Ages for seven years. Uh, he just got a gig in White Snake, so congratulations, Joel. And the singers we have are, are from, several are from Broadway. We have Kayla Reeves is from Texas. Uh, Robin Borneman is from Belgium. Uh, Russell Allen is from, from the band Adrenaline Mob and Symphony X. So. We have people, and Derek Wheeland, our, our musical director and keyboardist, you know, he's a Juilliard grad. So these are some top-notch people that have come into our camp. And here again, it's what makes this thing as good as it is. And the TSO thing is uh, when, you, when you do a tour, you know you've done a tour. 
you know? We do 51 shows in 50 days. We, we play two shows every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And trust me, when I wake up Monday morning, I feel it. But it is a tough tour, it is a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. And you know, for the most part, we get a lot of the same, we get a lot of return uh, members, not just in the band or not just singers, but also in the crew, because they're all, they're all very aware of how good this tour is and how well they're treated. Coming up, the TSO has some big projects they're working on this year and some advice for all you young rock stars out there. for you guys I mean this is incredible but I, you said you keep building and keep pushing forward what else are you guys working on? Uh, what's next well there's a couple records that are that are being worked on right now in Florida uh, Paul has Paul has several things that are always happening um, our project our main focus this year is one of these records will be completed and I'm not gonna give any names because I'm not sure which one um, <laughs> And then our, our big uh, event this year is Trans-Siberian Orchestra is playing a festival in Germany called the Wacken Festival. And it is a hard rock, heavy metal festival. We, um, we have done Europe a couple times and we've scratched the surface. So now we are trying to break into more of the mainstream, into more of the rock world. Uh, Trans-Siberian Orchestra is not just a holiday band. We have two non-seasonal records, uh, the first being Beethoven's Last Night and the second being Night Castle, which is the same TSO formula. It's, you know, instrumentally, it's, it sounds very similar vocally, but it's not, it has no holiday theme to it. Uh, so this is what we're going to present to this audience over there, and this is really quite, a, quite an accomplishment for us to do this. And along with this is their reunion of uh, my band Sabotage, which you mentioned uh, earlier how we, we tour, we haven't played in 12 years. Sabotage kind of, it was running its course right about the time TSO really started taking off. And management and, you know, and rightly so, we put a lot of work into Trans-Siberian Orchestra and, and this is what's, you know, we see the fruits of that. Sabotage was, was a band that was around for a long time and, and you know, this music industry is so difficult you can have uh, the best music, the best talent, all the best intentions, and sometimes with a little bad luck or just a, something here or there, you don't quite get where you want to go. So, but the uh, the demand and the the love for the band Sabotage in Europe is is stronger than ever still, and we're doing a reunion the, the same night the Trans Siberian Orchestra is playing. So this will be uh, this will be quite a momentous night. It's, uh, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know how this is going to go down. <laughs> There's a lot of things being talked about. I will certainly be there playing in both bands, and uh, I think it's going to be probably, you know, one of the most memorable nights that I'll ever have. That's now, being this legendary guy from <laughs> Horseheads, I'm going to say that because this man is incredible. What would you say to the kid in high school right now who says he wants to play in a rock band? I just spoke to a, uh, a middle school the other day. And these are all kids that are interested in music and they're musicians and stuff like that. You can't do any of this without practicing. You know, they, when I told them when I was their age, I was practicing two and three hours a day. They looked at me like I was, you know, like I had three heads. <laughs> How can I do that if I'm on my cell phone or what, you know, watching television or on the computer? You know, back then I didn't have any of this distraction. So this is what I did. Music is, is one of the best things that can ever happen in your life. Whether, whether you uh, succeed like I have or you just want to play just to express yourself. You know, music is a new language. Music is a lot of thought. Music is dedication. Music is, you know, everybody has a favorite song. When you hear a song, it just lights you up. If you're able to go on stage and play that song and light other people up, there's nothing like that. So this is what I love to do, and this is this is 
where I've gotten to, but it's taken a lot of work, hours and hours and hours. And, you know, depending on what instrument you want to play, you got to figure out how you're going to buy one. Drums are not cheap. Guitars aren't cheap, you know? Help your parents out, get a job, do something, you know? Uh, there's a lot of give and take with that. You give your parents a little, they give you a little, you know? You give them time, they give you time. It, it all it all works out in the end, but one thing that I did not have access to when I was young was the information available to me about music schools. And there are hundreds. I mean, we looked online the other day at music schools in New York State. There's hundreds. You know, Ithaca, Elmira has a music program. You know, Ithaca, Cornell, they're all over the place. Eastman up in Rochester is, is a big one. But there's also some other ones, uh, Full Sail in Florida. Uh, Musicians Institute of Technology that's out in uh, California, Berkeley, which is also in California and in Boston. Um, a lot of our TSO people are, from, are Berkeley grads. So there is, uh, there is no shortage of music schools and if you research and you know maybe music isn't your major or maybe it is your major, maybe you got something else you want to do along with it, I'm sure there's a school that can accommodate what you want to do, but, but take advantage of that, you know, learn Learn all the theory you can, learn all the, you know, learn how to sing, learn how to practice, learn how to focus. Uh, high school is, it's free, you know? You're there to learn, you're there to take these classes and, and apply yourself and take advantage of it now because once you're out of high school, you're not gonna get that back. Your next school that you go to, you're gonna have to pay for. And then when you get later on in life, you know, you get a job, you have a family, all of a sudden you have less time to dedicate to your instrument and, and the focus and the, and the thought to it. Now is the time to do that. So if you're young and you're really, like say you want to be a drummer, look me up. Because <laughs> <laughs> you teach as well too, don't you sometimes? Yeah, I, I have a few students. So do you have any students that you see inside of them this like extraordinary talent? Uh, yes, and act actually I have... Uh, I run the gamut of a nine-year-old kid <laughs> to a 65-year-old man. Wow. And the older gentleman, this is something that he wanted to do all his life, and I, I always tell him, I give him all the credit in the world for saying, I want to do this. And, you know, he's learning how to play the drums. It's his life dream. He wants to play drums and he wants to play in a band, so this is what we're doing. Uh, my nine-year-old student is, here again, he's not quite tainted with uh, cell phones and computers and all the other stuff to teenagers, but his mind is wide open. And what I can teach him, sure, he's still a kid, but I know next week when he comes back, he retains some of it and he practiced it. And here again, his parents are, are with him the whole time. We're friends, you know, they encourage him, they listen to me, and now we're starting to see some results in, in his playing. And it's it's so rewarding just, just to see that. But, you know, here again, it's it's, you go home, you get family support, you take the time to do it, and then you're gonna you're gonna have a good result. All right, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this just as much as I have. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>